grace, and peace. A brand new chapter. Acts 26. After several brief studies, we return now to long chapters. Complex chapters. This is New Testament video 406, Acts Lesson 82. Acts 26, the first 11 verses. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for another day of grace, for another chance to be edified, encouraged, and enlightened. As we search the scriptures, rightly dividing the word of truth, dispensational Bible study. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who will instruct us now through these inspired and preserved words, the King James Bible. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, Amen. Acts 26 Verses 1 Three eleven, read. Acts twenty six one. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand, and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day before thee touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. Especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews, which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I live the Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? I have verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did at Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme, and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Hmm. 
verses 1 to 11 of Acts 26. Paul, in front of King Agrippa, quickly review. Ever since Paul got in trouble with unsaved Israel in Jerusalem, in chapter 21, in the temple complex, he has been fighting legal battles in excess of two years. Acts 20. 1, 22, 23, 24, 25. Here we are, Acts 26. And Acts 22, after being arrested in Jerusalem, Paul preached, shared his testimony. For lost Israel's sake. Acts 22. Acts 23. He was in front of the Sanhedrin. The Jewish Supreme Court. The high priest. And the elders and the scribes. Pharisees and Sadducees. Etc. There's Paul's second speech, the Sanhedrin. In Jerusalem, lost Jews scheme to murder Paul, assassinate him. So he is sent away from Jerusalem to Caesarea. Jerusalem, the religious capital, Caesarea, the political capital. The Roman governor of Palestine, Judea, lives in Caesarea. He has headquarters there. Normally, he's in Caesarea. For the feast days of Judaism, he does travel to Jerusalem especially for Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Remember Pontius Pilate and Matthew to John was in Jerusalem, Roman governor. For Passover, he left Caesarea and went to Jerusalem. Some 30 years later, after Christ's trials, now the Apostle Paul, or should we say, Jesus Christ in the Apostle Paul is on trial. If Jesus Christ were on earth, Israel would be antagonistic against him personally. He's not here. But Paul is. He's in Paul, so they target Paul. Acts 24. That's Governor Felix. Paul delivering a third speech. Defense. Now it's Governor Felix. Acts 24, Felix is another 
unethical, crooked, dishonest politician. After leaving Paul bound in custody there for two years, Felix departs the office. Emperor Nero calls Felix back to Rome on corruption charges. Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, left Paul bound. That case can be my successor's headache. In comes Portius Festus, the new governor of Judea. That's Acts 25 now. Paul talking to Festus. Paul's fourth defense, discourse, sermon, speech. Festus desires to appease apostate Israel too. In Caesarea there, he offers Paul the chance to be tried in Jerusalem. Uh, no. <laughs> no, I've left Jerusalem. I'm not going back. Paul has awareness of his Roman rights. I'm finished with the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem. I ought to be tried in Caesarea. This is where Caesar's judgment seat is. The provincial political capital of Judea is Caesarea. I will be judged here in Caesarea, not Jerusalem. Festus ultimately is forced to recuse himself from this matter because Paul appeals to Caesar, the emperor himself. I call on the highest court of Rome to intercede here. The highest court is Nero himself. All right, Paul, if you have appealed to Caesar, thou shalt go to Caesar. That's Rome. Rome. The city of Rome. However, Festus cannot just ship Paul away and burden Nero with it without first specifying in writing the charges against Paul. What crimes, what specific laws have been broken? What crimes have been committed? Identify them. Well, Festus, I'm no expert in Jewish religion, superstition. I'm a Roman. Yet, Festus sees an opportunity to shift some of the responsibility over to King Agrippa II. 
Herod Agrippa II. Agrippa, you're familiar with Jewish religion. Help! Help me assess the situation so I can write to Caesar exactly what's the problem. Acts 25, 13. Oof, to the end of the chapter. Acts 25, 13. It's a long excerpt here. And after certain days, King Agrippa, that's Herod Agrippa, the second. This Agrippa, this Herod Agrippa, the second, is the son of Herod Agrippa, the first, of chapter 12. Herod Agrippa, the second, is the great grandson of Herod the Great of Matthew 2. Agrippa II is the great nephew of Herod Antipas, the Tetrarch of Galilee in Christ's earthly ministry, Luke 3. Well, enough of the complicated family tree there. One more note. Acts 25, 13. King Agrippa and Bernice, or Bernice, they are both siblings and lovers. <laughs> Agrippa and Bernice, Bernice, we can estimate their ages to be early 30s. This Agrippa II is the last of the Herodian dynasty. He will be in power for roughly 40 years into the future. Herod Agrippa II expired A.D. 100, age 70, when he died. Herod Agrippa II and his sister, romantic partner, <coughs> Bernice, Acts 25, 13, came unto Caesarea to salute Festus, the new governor, Felix's replacement. Acts 25, 14, and when they had been there many days in Caesarea, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix, about whom when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him. To whom I answered, it is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that he which is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. Therefore, when they were come hither, Without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth. Against whom, when the accuser stood up, they brought none accusation of such things as I supposed, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition, and of one Jesus, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether... He would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. Uh, that's false. 
He wanted to please the lost Jews, not to clarify Paul's case in Jerusalem, but to send Paul to Jerusalem so the Jews would have him in Jerusalem and kill him along the way, either en route to Jerusalem or at Jerusalem. Acts 25, 21. But when Paul had appealed to be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, the emperor, Caesar, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself. I want to listen to Paul's case. Tomorrow, said he, Festus, thou shalt hear him. And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come, and Bernice, Bernice, with great pomp, ceremony, pageantry, display, a show. Look, everyone, it's the last member of the Herodian dynasty. Bow, roll out the red carpet. Let's hear the fanfare. Oh, Herod Agrippa II. Let's not forget his wife, his lover, his sister. Oof, no, sorry. We'll say his sister. His sister. <laughs> Acts 25. Acts 25, 23. And on the morrow when Agrippa was come, and Bernice, Bernice, with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing this auditorium, with the chief captains and principal men of the city. At Festus's commandment, Paul was brought forth. So Paul is before all of them. A large crowd. 24, and Festus said, King Agrippa and all men which are here present with us, ye see this man, about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, oh, Paul's innocent? Yeah. Yeah. See, Festus admitted it. He didn't do so earlier. Hmm, look at that. Crooked. 25, and that he himself hath appealed to Augustus, I have determined to send him to Caesar. However, wait, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord, wherefore I have brought him forth before you, and specially before thee. See, you is the group. Specially before thee, thee is O King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not withal to signify the crimes laid against him. Not only is it unreasonable, foolish, it's also dangerous. Ephestus would send Paul away to the emperor, but the emperor has no reason why Paul has been sent here. Oh, well, Festus, you want to come to Rome too? Ooh. You're accusing a Roman citizen of wrongdoing, but you haven't actually pinpointed anything worthy of bonds or death, huh? Oh. Okay, well, Agrippa, please help me. I'm in a bind. I'm in a jam. Difficult situation. What do I do? What do I write? Acts 26. With the setting established, we move along to Acts 26. Paul's fifth defense. He will lay out more detail than he ever has. 
Not in Acts 22, or Acts 23, or Acts 24, or Acts 25. Acts 26. This is before King Agrippa II. Gentiles. Gentiles. Lost Israel is not here. Festus, Governor Festus, has authorized King Agrippa II to oversee this hearing. It's not a trial. Acts 26 is rather a hearing. Paul is not obligated to say anything to Agrippa. Because you see, he's reserving whatever else he has to say for the emperor. Festus had to butt out. If you appeal to Caesar, I wrap up the trial here. I can do nothing else. But before I send you to Emperor Nero, I want to lay out the crimes against you. Paul does not have to talk to Agrippa at all. That's Festus's problem. To specify the charges. But Paul is willing to speak before Agrippa the second. One, to share the gospel with this lost Gentile to also to indict unbelieving Israel, lost Israel. Acts 26, 1. Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Thou art permitted to speak for thyself. Then Paul stretched forth the hand, and answered for himself. He's ready to give an answer. 1 Peter 3, 15. Paul will not defend himself. But he will impart sound Bible doctrine. Acts 26 to I think myself happy, King Agrippa. I am so joyful. I express. Such pleasure. I am jubilant. I am ecstatic. I love to talk. Verse 29. These bonds. It is possible. Paul is shackled here. The pressure is on him. It's also on Festus and Agrippa because of these onlookers. We'll elaborate on that later. But Paul's ready to share the Word of God all right, King Agrippa, here I go. Hmm, let's see if they are interested. <laughs> Acts 26. 2. I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because I shall answer for myself this day 
before thee touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews. Three, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Herod Agrippa II is part Gentile Edomian by blood. But by religion, he is Jewish, a nominal Jew in name only. He has the authority over the Jerusalem temple, and Herod Agrippa also appoints the high priest. Agrippa is knowledgeable of Jewish customs, Jewish religion, Jewish debates. He is familiar with the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. So now we understand, we appreciate why Festus has enlisted the help of Agrippa. Help, it's a Jewish matter. I need some Jewish perspective. Agrippa is proficient in Judaism. Paul recognizes that too. Acts 26, 3. These questions, these debates. You know the customs, you are an expert in all customs and questions of the Jews. Three, wherefore I beseech thee to hear me patiently. Paul has a long sermon here. Twenty verses. King Agrippa, bear with me, tolerate me, put up with me. Acts 26, 4. Let's start at the beginning. My manner of life from my youth which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. Acts 22.3 Acts 22.3 I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, southern Turkey, yet brought up in this city, Jerusalem, at the feet of Gamaliel, Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers, and was zealous toward God, as ye all are this day. Paul's birthplace is Tarsus, Saul of Tarsus, Cilicia. Tarsus the city, Cilicia the region. Prophets. Territory. But Paul spent his childhood in Jerusalem. All the Jews know my history. They could testify right here regarding the details of my childhood. At 
the very beginning of my life, I was in Judaism. I'm not a convert, a, a proselyte, a Gentile convert. This has been my entire life. Acts 26, 5. Which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. The most straightest sect. Look at the emphasis there. The most straightest. See? That's awkward in English, but that captures the intensity of Luke's Greek. The superlative. I was in the strictest, most exact, rigorous, stringent sect of Judaism. The sect there. Hieresis. Remember that? Heresy. Heresy. Transliterated heresy. Acts 24. See Acts 24.14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, there it is, sect. Acts 24, 5, see, the sect there. Paul was a Pharisee. Acts 5, 17. The Sadducees are known as a sect, an offshoot of Judaism. Paul's Christianity, disparaged as the sect of the Nazarenes, that is also considered, according to the Jews anyway, an offshoot of Judaism. A splinter group. Acts 15, 5. Acts 15, 5. But there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees. Sect. So the Pharisees were a sect. The Sadducees were a sect. Both of Judaism. The Pharisees, as we remarked in chapter 23, the Pharisees were the conservatives in Judaism. The Sadducees were the liberals, the skeptics, the doubters. The Pharisees were the Literalists. Although the Pharisees, they valued tradition, the Sadducees did not. The Pharisees were Jewish nationalists. The Sadducees favored Rome. The Sadducees did not believe in angels, spirits, or resurrection. The Pharisees did. The Sadducees were priestly, aristocratic, wealthy. The Pharisees were from a variety of classes. They mingled with the common Jews more than the Sadducees did. The Sadducees were overwhelmingly isolated. They kept to themselves. So we don't read much about them in Matthew to John. Oh, they come out a little more in Acts. <laughs> After the Pharisees led the opposition against Christ in Matthew to John, 
and the Pharisees were put to shame when the Sadducees come to the forefront against Christ in early Acts. Paul was a Pharisee. He was a Bible student. He studied the law of Moses. He trained under a rabbi, Gamaliel, Gamaliel, Acts 22. Acts 5, Gamaliel was had in reputation among the people. He was a doctor of the law. He was the leading conservative Hebrew Bible teacher in the A.D. first century in Israel. And Paul was one of his students, Saul of Tarsus, in that elite class, a rabbinical scholar. As Saul of Tarsus, he was a Pharisee. Pharisee. Acts 22, 3. I was brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, Gamaliel, and taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers. Gamaliel, Gamaliel X 5, verse 34, a Pharisee. So Paul's mentor was a Pharisee. Acts 23, verse 6, but when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. So Paul's father was a Pharisee too. Paul's father was a Pharisee. Paul's rabbi, teacher, was a Pharisee. Philippians 3.5 Philippians 3.5 Philippians 3 is Paul's testimony. Philippians 3.5 Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Pharisee. Galatians 1, Galatians 1, verse 13, For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion, above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. It was the Jews' religion, not God's religion. In its purity given through Moses, it was God's religion. Uh, that was 1,500 years ago. Since Moses' time, the rabbis have watered down the pure law. They added their traditions, rabbinical interpretations of the law. There's the oral law now competing with the written law. Oral traditions. It's perverted. And the Lord Jesus Christ rebuked them for that in Matthew 15 and Mark 7 and Matthew 23 
and other places, other verses. Paul is a Bible believer. Saul of Tarsus, should I say. Before he's the Apostle Paul, Saul is a Bible student, a Bible believer in Judaism. He knows the Hebrew Bible here in the head, but there's no heart faith. That will come later. Acts 26, 6. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, unto which promise our twelve tribes, instantly serving God day and night, hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Acts 23, verse 8. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection. They have no hope of resurrection, which is why they are sad, you see. Acts 23, 8. Neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both resurrection and spiritual beings, spirit beings. Angels and spirits and resurrection, bodily resurrection. They're true, they're factual. Paul, or Saul, as a Pharisee, was a Bible believer. He believed in resurrection, spirits, and angels. Acts 26, 6. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. Two issues here we need to get straight. One is the hope, and two, the promise. One is the hope, the other is the promise. What is the hope? Paul is being judged here for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. The hope and the promise. Separate here. The hope of the promise, the hope, is bodily resurrection. Look at verse 8. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Okay? Uh, 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 what's that? Resurrection? Okay. Acts 23, 6. But when Paul perceived that the one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee, of the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am called in question. The dead have a hope. What is the hope of the dead? Uh, to be resurrected. Simple. Acts 24, 15. And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just, righteous, and unjust, unrighteous. Saved and lost. Saints and sinners. Verse 21. Except it be for this one voice. Acts 24, 21. 
that I cried, standing among them, touching the resurrection of the dead, I am called in question by you this day. 23.6. See? Acts 20. 8. 20. The hope of Israel is resurrection. Resurrection. So the hope of the promise, the hope is bodily resurrection. Now the promise. What is the promise? Acts 26, 6. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. The promise made of God. God made a promise. That promise to Israel's patriarchs is the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant. Genesis 12. Genesis 12, 1. This is the creation of the nation Israel. Genesis 12, 1. Now the Lord hath said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. See the nation, great nation, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee. And curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Ultimately, Israel will become a kingdom of priests. That's the ages to come, in the ages to come. Romans 4, Romans 4, listen. Romans 4, 16, therefore, and this is about Abraham, therefore it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, resurrection, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Anyway, the point is, God, this is Genesis 17, the Lord God, Jehovah God, will give to Abraham and his seed the land of Palestine, promised land, forever. Forever. The nation originating from Abraham, that's the nation Israel, unto a land that I will show thee, there's the promised land. So all of that is the promise. Israel being a kingdom of priests in some land. The promised land. Resurrection life, eternal life, is how Israel inherits that promised land forever. They are physically resurrected to enter that kingdom, that promised land, in the ages to come. The Apostle Paul has been doing nothing but preaching how prophecy has been fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. How Jesus Christ is that seed. How the Lord Jesus Christ is resurrected. Acts 13. Acts 13. 32, and we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us their children, and that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. 
And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, resurrection, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Jesus not only is Christ, he is also alive. Acts 25, 19, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition and of one Jesus, which was dead, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. Lost Israel refused to see Jesus as Christ, Messiah, and did not want to accept the fact he was raised from the dead. whether that was Peter's ministry or Paul's ministry. Israel is in unbelief from Acts 1 to Acts 28, the whole book of Acts. National Israel is lost and happy, comfortable being lost. Because Jesus was raised again, that proves he's Messiah Christ. Matthew 28. The chief priests who were Sadducees, resurrection deniers, when they heard about the Lord Jesus raised again, uh-uh, can't be, no, 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 body snatching. <laughs> See, read Matthew 28. They didn't believe Jesus resurrected. It's a body snatching. His disciples stole the corpse. That's why the tomb is empty. <laughs> if that's what they wanted to believe, you know what God said? Enjoy, have it, have the lie. See, when confronted with proof that their theology was wrong, the Sadducees didn't adjust their theology. They just dismissed whatever contradicted their theology. See that? That happens in denominationalism today. Oh no, we'll never admit the truth, no matter how much proof there is that our system is wrong. Never will we abandon it. Our tradition means much more to us than God's word ever will. All, all, well, at least they're honest. Apostate Israel is persecuting Paul for believing the Old Testament scriptures. See? The scriptures they don't believe. Acts 26, 6. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. Oh, wait. They were to be resurrected like Jesus Christ. They will be resurrected physically into that kingdom. Literal, physical, visible, earthy. Davidic Israeli kingdom. But Israel is an unbelief. They don't want to admit it. Acts twenty six six and now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, forefathers of Israel. Acts 
26, 7. Unto which promise are two tribes, oh, no, wait, it's not two tribes, huh? How many tribes here? Uh, five, ten, two, twelve, huh? Twelve, twelve tribes? Yes. Acts 26, 7. Unto which promise are twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Contrary to popular belief, there are no lost tribes of Israel. The only lost tribes of Israel exist in the minds of confused denominationalists. That's the only lost tribes up here. Speculation, imagination, fantasy land. has been preaching resurrection all through Acts, just like the twelve apostles. That resurrection of Jesus Christ is how national Israel will receive the promised land and the kingdom one day, but they refuse to acknowledge Jesus was resurrected. And yet their Hebrew Bible tells them resurrection is true and Messiah will rise again. Psalm 16, Acts 2, Acts 13, for example. They look forward to the kingdom. But how blind they are, huh? They didn't accept their king in Matthew to John or early Acts. So God raised Paul with a new gospel message forming the church, the body of Christ separate and distinct from Israel from Israel's believing remnant. Acts 26 7 the twelve tribes. It's also known as British Israelism. The ten northern tribes migrated and they became the British people and the Americans. <laughs> what that is, is someone assuming it's a benefit to be Israel today in the sight of God. So if we can fake ourselves to be Israel, then we'll receive Israel's blessings. See? And commit spiritual larceny. Everything in the book that's for Israel, since I'm Israel, it's for me. All those verses are mine. My promises. Wrong, 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 wrong. Listen. No dispensational Bible study again. There's the problem. Romans 11. If you struggle with this, dear friend, read Romans 11 50 times. You should grasp it at some point. Israel's fallen right now. What advantage is there to being Israel in the dispensation of grace? No advantage. None. None. Okay? Even if we were Israel, you know where the advantage is? There is no advantage. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God has concluded them all in unbelief, Jew and Gentile alike. 
that he might have mercy on all? Read Romans 11. There is no difference. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Paul's gospel is for everyone. It's available to everyone. Okay? And when they trust that gospel message, Christ died for our sins, he was buried and rose again the third day, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Acts 20, 24, the gospel of grace, the gospel of the grace of God, they become members of the church, the body of Christ. That's not Israel. See? God's agency now is the church, the body of Christ. So you know where the advantage actually is? It's in Christ and the body of Christ. There's no advantage to being a Jew today that was true in time past, not true now. There's no disadvantage to being a Gentile that is true today, was not true in time past. See? Rightly divide. Time past, but now, ages to come. Read Ephesians 2 50 times if you want. Get that straight. When Solomon, King Solomon, died, David's kingdom, the twelve tribes, were divided. The ten northern tribes became the northern kingdom, the kingdom of Israel. The two southern tribes became the kingdom of Judah. Ten northern tribes, two southern tribes. The ten northern tribes, because of their repeated violation of the law of Moses, the courses of judgment, chastisement, punishment there, Leviticus 26, the Assyrians, roughly 700 years before Christ, entered the northern regions, the northern ten tribes, and deported them, whoop, to Assyria, exile out of the promised land. A hundred years later, six hundred years prior to Christ, the Babylonians took as political prisoners the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom. Northern kingdom, Assyria. Southern kingdom, Babylon. Promised land is vacant. Will someone say, well, what about those ten tribes? They never came back to the land. We read of Judah returning from Babylon to Palestine. Ezra, Nehemiah, What about the ten northern tribes? Okay, I'm glad you asked. A wonderful question. Excellent. Here's the answer. Do you want it? Let's see. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles 30. Second Chronicles 30. 2 Chronicles 30. The northern ten tribes were isolated from the Jerusalem temple down south. The northern tribes had the worst kings than the southern tribes. Those believers in the ten northern tribes who wanted to worship the Lord in the Jerusalem temple down south, what happened to them? 2 Chronicles 30, verse 1. And Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah, Israel, and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh, northern tribes, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel. 
For the king had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at that time, because the priests had not sanctified themselves sufficiently, neither had the people gathered themselves together to Jerusalem. And the thing pleased the king and all the congregation, so they established a decree to make a proclamation throughout all Israel, from Beersheba even to Dan, Beersheba south, Dan north, extreme north, extreme south that they should come to keep the Passover unto the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem. For they had not done it of a long time in such sort as it was written. So the posts, the messengers, couriers, went with the letters from the king and his princes throughout all Israel and Judah. And according to the commandment of the king, saying, Ye children of Israel... Turn again unto the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that's Jacob, and he will return to the remnant of you that are escaped out of the hand of the kings of Assyria. And be not ye like your fathers and like your brethren, idolaters, which trespassed against the Lord God of their fathers, who therefore gave them up to desolation, as ye see now be ye not stiff-necked as your fathers were, but yield yourselves unto the Lord and enter into his sanctuary, which he hath sanctified forever, and serve the Lord your God, that the fierceness of his wrath may turn away from you. For if ye turn again unto the Lord, see, and this is the law, the law of Moses, obey equals blessings, disobey equals curses. For if ye turn again, 2 Chronicles 30, verse 9, unto the Lord your brethren and your children shall find compassion before them that lead them captive, so that they shall come again into this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn away his face from you if ye return unto him. So the posts pass from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun. But they laughed them to scorn and mocked. Ha ah, ha See? Unbelievers. The Lord, nobody here wants to hear anything from Him. <laughs> they want their idols. See? Eleven. Eleven. Nevertheless, divers of Asher and Manasseh and of Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. Those are believers. There were believers in those northern tribes who left the north and came down south. We love the Lord God, Jehovah God. We want to worship and serve Him in Jerusalem at the temple like the law commands. 2 Chronicles 34, again, 2 Chronicles 34, verse 1, that was King Hezekiah, now this is King Josiah, 2 Chronicles 34, Josiah was 8 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem, Jerusalem, southern kingdom, 1 in 30 years, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and walked in the ways of David his father, and declined neither to the right hand nor to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet young, he began to seek after the God of David his father, and in the twelfth year he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem from the high places and the groves and the core of the images and the molten images. See the idols? And they break down the altars of Balaam, plural, Baal, in the plural form, in his presence. And the images that were on high above them, he cut down in the groves and the core of the images, all the statues, the grottoes, the shrines, the altars, and the molten images. He break in pieces and made dust of them and strode it upon the graves of them that had sacrificed unto them. Oh, this is revival, isn't it? 
And he burnt the bones of the priests upon their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And so did he in the cities of Manasseh and Ephraim and Simeon, even unto Naphtali, or Naphtali, with their mattocks round about. And when he had broken down the altars and the groves and had beaten the graven images unto powder and cut down all the idols throughout all the land of Israel, he returned to Jerusalem. Now in the eighteenth year of his reign, when he had purged the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Maasiah, Maasiah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Johaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. And when they came to Hilkiah, the high priest, they delivered the money that was brought into the house of God, which the Levites that kept the doors had gathered of the hand of Manasseh and Ephraim, and of all the remnant of Israel, and of all Judah and Benjamin, and they returned to Jerusalem. Believers from those northern tribes migrated southward and resettled in the south, the southern kingdom. You can go back even further with King Rehoboam in 2 Chronicles 11 and King Asa, 2 Chronicles 15. The believers in the northern kingdom migrating southward at the very beginning of the divided kingdom. All twelve tribes were represented in the south because the north grew more and more apostate without Solomon's temple. See, Solomon's temple was in Jerusalem. Acts 2, okay. Acts 2, Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost, Peter's sermon, the Apostle Peter, look, Acts 2, preaching, verse 36, therefore, let the remaining two tribes, no, Acts 2, 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ, all the house of Israel. Now, how many tribes would there be in all the house of Israel? Up uh, to? Twelve. Twelve. There are no ten lost tribes. The Holy Spirit through Peter doesn't believe in any lost tribes. Maybe the Holy Spirit doesn't know as much as denominational minds today. Peter believed the Holy Ghost talking through Peter affirmed all the house of Israel is present there in Acts 2.36. All twelve tribes are represented in Jerusalem listening to Peter. James 1.1 1, 1. James 1.1 1, 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the two tribes which are scattered abroad. Greeting. No. James, a servant of God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve. Twelve, 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 twelve tribes, which are scattered abroad. Greeting. So, look at that. Peter, Acts 2, all the house of Israel, represented in Jerusalem there, at Pentecost. Paul, he thinks all twelve tribes still exist. 
James, all twelve tribes. See that? Now we either believe the scriptures or we don't. Acts 26, 7, unto which promise are twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. Instantly serving. They're fervent. They're eager. They're zealous. But look, Israel as a nation is lost. Acts 26, 7. For which hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused of the Jews. I am accused of the Jews. I am on trial for affirming Bible truth. Resurrection. Bodily resurrection. Paul has preached Jesus' resurrection and the resurrection of everyone else one day. All believers and all unbelievers. If Israel really believed their Hebrew Bible, they would not be mistreating Paul, accusing Paul now. See again how Israel's unbelief is manifested, placed into the record of Scripture. Acts 26, 8. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? Paul is not simply addressing Agrippa, though. The plural pronoun there, you, that's all of Paul's audience. The Romans, all these Gentiles, they don't believe resurrection. It's true. It's impossible. Make believe. Fiction. Resurrection. God raising the dead, that's impossible. Paul asks, why do you not believe in resurrection? All you Gentiles here in Caesarea, you plural, see, in our King James Bible, God is God. He is the Creator. If He can speak the heaven and the earth into existence from nothing, and He can hold all of creation in the palm of His hand, and if He so wanted, crush it in the blink of an eye. If He is the Almighty Creator. And He gives life to non-life. He gave life to non-life during the creation week. He breathed into man's nostrils <sighs> the breath of life and man became a living soul. Agrippa, you know that Hebrew Bible, right? You're a member of Judaism. Paul, a rabbinical scholar, he knows that Hebrew Bible better than all of them put together in that room. Why do you doubt resurrection? Is God limited? Is there anything too hard for Almighty God? No. Then why?
Do you think resurrection incredible? All these Gentiles, they don't believe resurrection. Hmm. Incredible, not in the sense of, oh wow, look at that, how incredible. Incredible in the sense of, it can't be, it's not true. Incredible. That's hard to believe, resurrection. <laughs> Like the scoffers, the mockers in Athens, who ridiculed Paul when they heard him mention resurrection. Ha 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 ha. Well, we have to remember Agrippa has a close affinity relationship with the temple in Jerusalem and the high priest. Agrippa chooses the high priest. What do we know about the high priest back in Acts 5 anyway? Acts 5. Acts 5, 17. Then the high priest rose up and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, see, sect of the Sadducees. What do we know about the Sadducees? Matthew 22, 23. Matthew 22, 23. The same day came to the Lord Jesus the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. Mark 12. Mark 12. 18. Then come unto him the Sadducees, which say there is no resurrection. Luke. Luke 20. 27. Then came to him certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. Acts 23. 8. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Agrippa does not want to appear to be a fool in front of his friends, the Sadducees. Now, the Sadducees are not here. True. But, they will hear about, oh, Agrippa believes in resurrection. See, word will eventually reach the Sadducees. So Herod disagrees with us, huh? Oh, well, there goes that friendship. And Herod loses his allies with the priests. Remember the Sadducees. They're usually priests. They're the priestly sect. Like I told you, there's pressure here. Paul isn't intimidated. But Herod Agrippa is. And wait, Festus. Well, he'll grow uncomfortable too. Wait. Acts 26. 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. 
and being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. So we finish this. As in chapter 22, Paul will explain. Now in Acts 22, it was before lost Israel. In Acts 26, it's before lost Agrippa, lost Gentiles. But the point remains the same. What happened to Paul to get him to where he is now from where he used to be? At Saul of Tarsus, he had a ministry. He was dishonorably discharged <laughs> from Satan's ministry there. And he has been in God's ministry now for 30 years. What happened? What transformed him? Agrippa, you'll hear it from me like Israel heard it from me in Acts 22 years earlier. Acts 9 Acts 22, Acts 26, Paul's salvation and commissioning. Luke writing secondhand in Acts 9. Paul recounting that firsthand, Acts 22, for Israel. Now he repeats it for Gentiles, Acts 26. As Saul of Tarsus, Acts 26, 9, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do a few things, some things, many things, many, many things, contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. So, Saul of Tarsus resolved. He determined he decided, I, I should do this. I ought to do it. Do what? Do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Like his unbelieving Jewish accusers in Acts, Saul's blind hatred and religious fanaticism stirred him up to the point where he rebelled vehemently against the Lord Jesus Christ. I opposed anything and everything concerning that Jesus of Nazareth. Remember Nazareth there? Nazareth, the despised place? The Nazarene? Can there anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> John 1, Nathaniel said, No. Uh, Nathaniel, you're wrong. Jesus of Nazareth, the Savior, the Messiah, the Redeemer, He's from Nazareth. He is. But see, that's not where he was born. He was born in Bethlehem, Judah. Micah 5, 2. But Israel rejected him. So when he returned from Egypt, he couldn't settle. But in Nazareth, the despised place, Matthew 2, Luke 4, he was brought up in Nazareth. He wouldn't have been in Nazareth had Israel received him. Hmm. When he was born in Bethlehem, how many visited him? Uh, well, Matthew 2, let's just say this. When the Gentiles from the east came to worship the Lord Jesus, the chief priests and scribes didn't care. Oh. And those were Israel's religious leaders. The wise men 
went to see young Lord Jesus. He was as much as two years old there in Matthew 2. We've come to worship the King of the Jews. Oh, well, yeah, the prophets do say he'll be born in Bethlehem of Judea. If you want, you can go see him, but we aren't coming. So the wise men went without the chief priests and scribes. Well, when Herod the Great began slaughtering the Lord Jesus' contemporaries, the young children in Bethlehem Ephrata, the Lord Jesus fled to Egypt and lived there for a while with Joseph and Mary. When he returned from Egypt, Matthew 2, he settled in Nazareth, the despised place. Hmm. Acts 26, 10, 9, reread 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, the religious leaders. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them, and I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Saul of Tarsus, Acts 7, 57. Stephen there, preaching to the Sanhedrin, before he loses his life. The Holy Ghost fills Stephen. So it's the Holy Ghost addressing the Sanhedrin. You perverted religious leaders of Israel. Listen. Oh, Acts 7, 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice and raised their hands and cried out, Praise the Lord, we believe. No. Acts 7, 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him, Stephen, with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him. Dead. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. Saul, Saul of Tarsus, there he is. That's the Apostle Paul as a lost, hell-bound sinner. There he is. Acts 8, 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. Paul, Saul here, was satisfied. He was pleased. He was gratified. Oh, what pleasure. Ooh, sadistic. Acts 8, 1, And Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church, Messianic church, Israel's believing women. This is not the church, the body of Christ. More than one church in Scripture. The church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. 3, And as for Saul, look, he made havoc of the church. He decimated it. He wrecked it. He ravaged it. Entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Ruthless, callous, cruel Saul of Tarsus. Acts 9, 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, extradition papers, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, 
whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Hmm. Saul of Tarsus will have an extremely rude awakening before he reaches Damascus, and we'll save that for our next study, the rest of Acts 9 there. Saul of Tarsus is on his way to Damascus and hell. At a breakneck speed, the Lord is watching from above, and He will intercept Saul. It will be a life-changing event. Acts 9, 13. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil, 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 evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name, all the Messianic Jews, all the Jews who have trusted, accepted, received Jesus as Messiah Christ. Ananias is one of them. Acts 22. Acts 22, 4. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Verse 19. Acts 22, 19. And I said, Lord, they know that I am imprisoned and beat in every synagogue. Them that believed on thee, and when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. Yeah. Acts 7. Galatians 1. Galatians 1. 13. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion. We've read this already, reread it. How that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God, the Messianic church, not the body of Christ, and wasted it. I decimated it. Genocide. 14. Galatians 1, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous, zealous of the traditions, traditions of my fathers. Saul was a religious fanatic. He was a nut. He was a lunatic. He was a wild man. And don't ever forget it. This was not in the name of atheism. Or prostitution. Or drug dealing. Or tax collecting. The publicans. Or any of the other sins that the professing church today tends to target, but it ignores its own sins in the church buildings. <laughs> Saul was a Bible scholar. It was in the name of religion. religion. In the name of, quote, God. Saul of Tarsus did the devil's work and giving God all the credit. John 16, 2. See that? See? 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 Oh, see it. See it. Philippians. Philippians. Philippians 3, 6. Concerning zeal persecuting the church. See? Zealous. Zealous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
zealous in religion, just like lost Israel there, constantly badgering Paul during those trials, all through Acts. First Timothy one thirteen. First Timothy 1.13 Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly. Oh, oh. In unbelief, in unbelief, Saul was especially active in Jerusalem, where he imprisoned, Acts 26, 10, many of the Christians, no, many of the saints. Be sure you get that, Acts 26, 10. In our Acts studies already, those studies of Acts chapters 1 to 9, I never called those believers Christians. For a reason. Now, the phraseology is, Saul persecuted those Christians. No, 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 no. Paul doesn't say, I persecuted the Christians. I shut up the Christians in prison. He shut up the saints. The saints. The saints there. The set apart ones. The holy ones. The hallowed ones. The sanctified ones, saint, sanctify, holy, hallow, set apart. These were the members of the Messianic Church. Why you do not want to call them Christians is, let's try Acts 11. If we're Bible believers, let's believe the Bible, huh? Amen, 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 amen. Acts 11, 20. Six, And when he, Barnabas, had found him, Saul, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Jerusalem. Uh, in Rome? In Antioch. Antioch, Syria. Later in Acts 26, we'll comment on that title, Christian, Christians, there. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch, and that's Acts 11. So if we want to be technical, and we should be technical, the Christians are those beginning in Acts 11 who are believers. See that? See? Okay. Saul of Tarsus was heading Israel's rebellion against Jesus Christ and his followers, those Messianic Jews, those believers. He, Acts 26.10, having received authority from the chief priests, he had permission from the chief priests to shut up those saints in prison. Look, and verse 10, Acts 26, 10, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. When these Jewish believers were executed, Paul agreed to it. I gave my voice against them. Here is the proof text. to lend credence to the notion that Paul was a member of the Sanhedrin. Saul of Tarsus belonged to the Sanhedrin, the Jewish Supreme Court. Paul cast his vote to put them to death. He had to be a member of the Sanhedrin. Okay, listen. Personally, I think that is eisegesis, or eisegesis, reading something into the verse that isn't there. Rather, exegesis, taking the meaning out from the verse, rather than forcing a meaning into the verse, imposing a false 
interpretation. If we take the meaning out of the verse, I gave my voice against them. That is, Paul... It's not Paul was actually casting a vote here, throwing pebbles, colored stones, or whatever. I gave my voice against them. It was Saul was supporting their death. And don't forget, there he was holding Stephen's murderous clothes. Acts 7, Acts 22. In that way, he was advocating the death. I'll hold your clothes. You go ahead and kill him. See? And there's nothing there about voting. Paul was there shouting. Saul of Tarsus was there yelling. Kill them! Kill them! Kill them! In the name of religion. Religion. Religion, 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 religion. The Jews' religion. Not God's religion. In every synagogue. See that? Acts 26, 10. I punished them oft. He made this a habit. A custom. He frequently did this. I punished them oft, often. Acts 26, 11, in every synagogue. Jerusalem had roughly 500 synagogues during that time. Saul of Tarsus was showing up in all of them as often as he could, or a great many of them. He was busy in religion. Serving Satan. It is possible even now to be religious and not serve the Lord. Watch out. Be careful. Ooh, be careful. Acts 26, 11, And I punished them oft in every synagogue, Cruel, brutal, savage, like a wild animal. And I compelled them to blaspheme. You want to follow Jesus of Nazareth? I'll show you what will happen. And Saul of Tarsus was intimidating. He was also beating them. Acts 22, beating them. He was torturing them. You will recant. You will renounce your faith in Jesus as Messiah. Reject him, or you will suffer. That was Saul of Tarsus. And he... was enthusiastic, zealous, passionate here. Acts 26, 11, And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. He would hunt them down. A manhunt. Chase after them. Wherever you hide, you can't hide forever from me. There is Saul of Tarsus, exceedingly mad. Uh, this is not rage, as in the modern versions. He was raging, he was furious, he was angry. Th that's not mad here. Mad in this sense, it's related, the Greek word is related to another word from which we get maniac. Now, what is a maniac? Uh, someone who's lunatic, insane, crazy, mentally ill. Saul 
would persecute them even unto the strange cities. Strange is not weird. Strange is foreign. He would drive them out of Jerusalem. There were some in Damascus he was chasing down before the Lord stopped him permanently. We'll see that in the next study. Saul of Tarsus was exceedingly mad. Mad. Luke six. Luke six eleven. And they were filled with madness and communed one with another what they might do to Jesus. Filled with madness. Madness is insanity. Craziness. Nuts. They're nuts. They're spiritually nuts. The Lord Jesus Christ worked a miracle on the Sabbath. Oh! tradition will destroy him for it uh, yeah well ignoramuses they're mad lunatic Acts 26 11 exceedingly mad look Acts 26, 11, exceedingly mad. This is a related word in Greek. John 10, 20. And many of them said, He hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? <laughs> Jesus is crazy. Why hear? Why do you listen to him? This is not anger. This is supposed insanity crazy he's crazy you're crazy if you listen to him Acts 12 15 see that and they said unto her thou art mad crazy that's not angry that's not raging that's not all there upstairs the lights on but no one's home Acts 26, 24. This will be later in Acts 26. Acts 26, 24. And as he thus spake for himself, Paul speaking, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. There it is, man. See? Man. Same word as verse 11. Thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. There it's on the on. Mania. Mania. Mad. Mania. Manic. He's a maniac. 25. But he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus. In 1 Corinthians 14, 23, one more about being mad there. Crazy. 1 Corinthians 14, 23, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? Nuts! Lunatic! Deuteronomy 32.18 Deuteronomy 32.18 Moses looking into the future God giving him prophetic insight Here is Israel in the last days up to the second coming Deuteronomy 32.18 Of the rock that begat thee thou art unmindful and hast forgotten God that formed thee. Israel doesn't remember 
has chosen not to remember. Jehovah God, the God who formed them, beginning with Father Abraham. It's not, oh, they have Alzheimer's, they don't remember him. It's not that. It's not they forgot God in the sense that they couldn't help it. No. What happened was, I've said this repeatedly, say it again. The church, the body of Christ, has forgotten the Lord Jesus Christ through Paul's ministry because we've been watching the devil wave his hand and, and we're distracted. Huh? Oh, oh. oh, round and round because Satan has polluted us, sidetracked us, Look at this, look at that, and while we're looking at this and that and everything else, we're ignoring the Lord's ministry through the Apostle Paul. Christ's heavenly ministry, Romans to Philemon, Romans to Philemon, Romans to Philemon. We go to Genesis to Malachi, Matthew to John, early Acts, Hebrews to Revelation. That's mine, that's mine. Well, what about Romans to Philemon? Oh, well... Paul is a supplement to the Bible. We don't follow a man, we follow Jesus. And those who claim that, they follow man-made denominations. Talk to them, you'll see. Oh yeah, we follow Jesus, we don't follow men. <laughs> and it's man-made denominationalism. They don't want to follow the Lord Jesus Christ as revealed through the Apostle Paul's ministry. Uh-uh. Nope. Well, Israel, instead of listening to Moses, as we should listen to Paul, instead of listening to Moses, Israel listened to everyone else and everything else. Uh-huh. So, when Jesus Christ showed up and Matthew to John, to minister to them. Oh, who's this? He was the fulfillment of the Bible they were expected to believe. That's who he is. Did they see him for who he was? No, they saw him for who he wasn't. He's an imposter. He's not our king. Beelzebub. He's Satan's friend. He's a blasphemer. He perverts the nation. He's a seditionist. He's crazy. John 10. Oh, yeah. Israel is spiritually crazy. In Matthew to John, not thinking properly. It's not God's fault. So, after centuries upon centuries of the idols and the ignoring Jehovah God, ignorant of the Lord's purpose and plan for them, here is Israel in Matthew 3. John the Baptist. Father God's messenger, the forerunner of Messiah Jesus. Here is John the Baptist. Matthew 3, 2. John the Baptist preached in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So, John the Baptist and Jesus Christ, God the Son, Jesus Christ, John the Baptist, God the Father, God the Father commissioned John the Baptist, John 1, God the Father commissioned his Son, Jesus Christ. So there's God the Father and God the Son, both calling Israel to repentance in Matthew. Repent. What does repent mean? Repent is not, I'm so sorry, I'm 
so sorry for my sins. I'm real sorry. No, that is penitence. It's also not penance. It's not sorrow for sin, penitence. It's not suffering for sin. Those are the Protestant and Roman Catholic errors. A misunderstanding of repentance. Repentance, metanoia, a change in mind. Think differently. You people are spiritually nuts. You are to be God's kingdom of priests. You haven't got a clue. You're thinking like the world. You don't have my Father's Word in you, and you don't want me to tell you my Father's Word to you. That was essentially what Christ expressed to them. John the Baptist was beheaded. Jesus Christ was crucified. Israel didn't want John and didn't want Christ. Lunatic! Lunatic! But look, Matthew 4, 24, And his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils. See, that was Israel's problem. And those which were lunatic, and those which had the palsy, and he healed them. Lunatic, lunatic, that's Israel too. Lunatic, spiritually crazy. Holes with mental problems in the physical realm. Jesus healed them to show, I can deliver you from your spiritual lunacy, if you want. Just like the devil possession. The nation itself is possessed. Mm -hmm. Matthew 17, 15. Look, here's a symbol of Israel. Matthew 17, 15. Matthew 17, 15. This son here. Matthew 17, 14 to 21. That is a picture of Israel. Look. Matthew 17, 15. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. Yeah, that's Israel also. Well, while there was a believing remnant in Matthew to John, most of Israel didn't believe, did not repent, did not believe. So there's another call to repentance. Here's the Holy Ghost. Father rejected, Son rejected, Holy Ghost now, the third member, the last member of the Godhead. Acts 2, 38. Here's Peter. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent! You still haven't repented. You haven't changed your mind yet. You don't think like God's people still after three plus years. John the Baptist ministry, all of Christ's earthly ministry, now in early Acts, Israel still hasn't nationally repented, changed the mind. Uh, do it now, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, Messiah, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In early Acts, Peter offers them the kingdom that they could have had if they had only repented. That was the kingdom preached in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They rejected the king. They demanded he be crucified. They insisted on it. Okay, all you people listening in Acts 2, all the house of Israel, you crucified Messiah Christ. He's coming back one day with or without your conversion. He will reign whether you are ready or not. And if you are not ready, He will make you His enemies there, His footstool. And he will rule from David's throne. Stephen.
saw the wrath on its way and rather than believing Stephen's message there they killed Stephen, didn't they? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, here was Saul of Tarsus. He was nuts too. Exceedingly mad. Acts 7, Acts 8, Acts 9. Nevertheless, As Paul, Saul, is outside of Damascus, the Lord Jesus Christ does return, but not in flaming fire and vengeance, not in wrath and war, but in grace, mercy, and peace. That will be our next study. We will go back to Acts 9. Compare it to Acts 22 and Acts 26. What happened to Saul of Tarsus to transform him into the Apostle Paul? He will tell us again. As in 22, so in 26. And we'll hear more details than what was given in Acts 9 and what was given in Acts 22. Oh. Acts 26, 1 through 11. That's where we planned to cease. That is sufficient. Dear Father, how we will always be in your debt, and you will never be in ours. Thank you for Christ dying for our sins, being buried, being raised again. That we could have forgiveness of sins and eternal life in Him. Thank you for the gospel of grace. That gospel of grace, Paul's gospel. May we learn even more and grow up even more in the scriptures as we explore Acts 26 even more. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen.